Looking to start a podcast but don't know where to begin? Look no further. The team at Dodge Media Productions has 20 years of experience as podcast listeners and observing the industry and eight years experience in podcast production. We can help you take your podcast from idea to fruition and we'll make the process seamless and easy. We'll help you with everything from recording and editing to hitting the charts on Apple Podcasts. So what are you waiting for? Contact us today and let's get started. DodgeMediaProductions.com You're listening to Dodge Movie Podcast. Your hosts are Christy and Mike Dodge, the founders of Dodge Media Productions. We produce films and podcasts, so this is a podcast about films. Join them as they share their passion for filmmaking. Welcome back, everybody, to the Dodge Movie Podcast. This is episode 164, and we will be talking about the 1977 film Star Wars. Do I have to pay Lucasfilm if I go... That's a really good question, because I bet that is somewhat of a trademark sound effect. I'm sure if you used it in a movie. I think every nine-year-old boy in 1977 learned to make that sound. I agree. The director, like you said, the writer and director is George Lucas. It stars Mark Hamill, Harrison Ford, Carrie Fisher, and Alec Guinness. The DP was Gilbert Taylor... He has been working since 1948. He did 1964's A Hard Day's Night, 1976's The Omen, and 1980's Flash Gordon. Ah. Savior of the human. Oh, <laughs> maybe I can't sing too much of that. Looking right. After me. <laughs> it was filmed in Guatemala, Arizona, Tun... 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 Tunisia? Yeah, thanks. <laughs> I kept wanting to put an extra Inesia in there. Mexico, Death Valley, and England, I believe, in a soundstage. Yeah, yeah, I think it was, was it Pinewood? It's one of those famous ones. Mm -hmm. The synopsis is Luke Skywalker joins, joins forces with a Jedi Knight, a cocky pilot, a Wookiee, and two droids to save the galaxy from the Empire's world destroying battle station while also attempting to rescue Princess Leia from the mysterious Darth. Vader. Dun, dun, dun. I bet you um, I didn't need to read that to you for you to remember what this movie was about. Me, I remembered. Right. Perhaps there are some in the listening audience who did not immediately know the synopsis of the film. Okay, quite a few taglines. And most of them, I mean, taglines are for marketing purposes, but some of them are specifically very much. For the 1979 reissued poster, it's back. The Force will be with you in all. For only three weeks. Wow, a reissue in 79. Mm hmm. Star Wars Happy Birthday poster? May the Force be with you, one year old today. <laughs> I didn't know they did like birthday posters I've or never birthday heard of releases. It before or since. Well, I guess when you have a movie like Star Wars, maybe you do. The Force will be with you. Okay, that was kind of a dud. Uh, somewhere, somewhere in space, this could all be happening right now. That one's yeah. kind of interesting because like there's this whole idea of, you know, maybe we're not alone and maybe there are other planets that we aren't even afraid of. Our galaxy is so big, like, you know, so somewhere in space, this all could be happening right now. Right. Except the opening title card says a long time ago. Oh. So marketing guys <laughs> maybe didn't see the film. The 1982 reissue, the original is back. <laughs> okay. <laughs> they apparently capitalized on this movie over and over and over. Yeah, from 77 <laughs> through 82, apparently, they just kept showing it. A long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. I love it. That's the best tagline. It really is. It really is. Yeah, yeah. And so the last one for a teaser poster, coming to your galaxy this summer. <laughs> oh, geez. Uh-huh. That's, that's marketing at its worst. Yep. All right. Kick us off with your pickup line. Well, I just mentioned it. The title card says a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Mm -hmm. And you had an interesting bit of trivia that you read about that scrolling. Well, there are a couple interesting bits. The technical part of it that I read was they did that by putting it on the floor and moving the camera across the yellow letters on a black background. Wow. And now we would think, of course, you'd use After Effects, right? And it'd be trivial. The other thing was it was much, much longer. And Lucas was at a party with his filmmaker friends, including, I think, De Palma and some other directors. And they told him, George, this is crap. There's way too much text in here. 
And he's like, well, what do you want me to do about it? So they sat down a couple of them and they cut it down for him. So that's really good buddies, yeah. right, to help him out. Yeah. Because when you watch this film, it's a lot of text, even the version they cut down. It's a lot of text. It is a lot of text. And it's funny because I feel like that has been lampooned yeah. in other films, the usage of that. Right. Like, and I, I think George was trying to, in that case too, call back to some of the old serials. I've never seen that technique before. To me, when you see the text scrolling into the distance, that is Star Wars. Mm -hmm. And you can't do that without it being a conscious callback. And in fact, pretty much every science fiction movie ever since then is built around the tropes that Star Wars built. Mm -hmm. Right? I think you could even argue all of the Marvel films can trace their lineage back to this film. Yeah. I wonder, is that font trademarked? It might be now, but I do think all all typefaces are inherently copyrighted. Well, and I guess I meant more... To I, use that technique is The that, Star Wars font. Not... Because right. it's very Helvetica. Like, it's very... The font of the story is pretty... Right. But the Star... What, you know, like on every poster, the way right. that Star Wars... Given their budget, I don't know if they had a, a, a typeface constructed just for them, but... I need one of my font nerds to tell me. I know. There's a whole font rabbit hole you could fall down, I bet. It certainly could. And it was interesting that uh, we talked a little bit there about the serials because they were kind of, I think you would say, melodramatic a little bit over the top, probably, you know, with their cliffhangers. And when one of the techniques they had in editing was all the wipes and the mm -hmm. different kinds of wipes, including this, like, bizarre diamond wipe i had never seen before and i haven't watched it a whole lot of cereals so i can't say but i'm not sure that was even a thing back then maybe it was the diamond wipe that's crazy i remember in film school dustin morrow talking about like somebody was kind of bored and they were just throwing in every transition right. that was available when in premiere they or discovered something. the transitions <laughs> tab and they're just like okay we're going to use them all but, and I do remember, and now my mind is just failing me, there's certain ones that mean something, like some one of them means the passage of time, one of them, like, I wish I could remember them. Right. But, but they rarely use them anymore, and it's almost like hokey if you do. Right, I was thinking of the Whirlpool one, <laughs> was super popular maybe in the 80s. Yeah, it was like back in, again, in the early to mid 80s, you always knew the one kid who had a Mac because their paper had 70 fonts in it, <laughs> yeah. right? The rest of us just used that one font that the Panasonic dot matrix printer could use. Uh -huh. And the Mac kid had, had 70 fonts. So it's kind of the same thing when they discovered the transitions, maybe they get a little bit more. Yeah, well, but I guess, you know, JJ Abrams is famous for his lens flare. So, yeah. you know, you can, you can Didn't do your own the thing. the 70s show, wasn't there a show? I that think it did the whirlpool. Yeah, it's it was that what you mean when you say whirlpool? yeah, where it, it like it twirls, spins. Yeah, yeah, either clockwise or counterclockwise. No, and did they only do it when they were high? I'm not sure. I feel like I, now I want to now I'm I'm going to go down a transitions rabbit hole because I feel like the Partridge Family had a specific transition oh, between. Yeah. Well, you know what I would do now. The Brady Bunch had an auditory one, didn't they? They had like a little. Like, not like a little doodaloo kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. I feel like if I was doing the Partridge Family today, I would do it in the style of those Mondrian, the different rectangles. Yes, that's yeah. how you would do I it. I think. Yeah, I feel like they um, did. So, the the other thing is, uh, you, you notice this was at at the time. I think it it had a decent budget. If I remember correctly, it was like ten or eleven million dollars, which for seventy seven is right. A decent budget. And it's amazing to see how, what things hold up and what things don't. So every single one of those miniature ships in space looks awesome, even today. Yet every single one of the computer screens they use looks hokey. I mean, it's ludicrous how bad the graphics is. And at the time they couldn't, they couldn't do anything different, really. One color. Yeah. And everything's like the ray trace vector graphic-y kind of thing. It's like a wireframe. Uh, compared to what we have now, that's absolutely ridiculous. And you know, they, they famously used like a, a television studio mixing board for the Death Star when now there's, you know, touch screens on your phone. And 
so some of the things didn't move forward particularly well, but oh my gosh, those, those, you know, the X-Wings and the TIE Fighters and the Millennium Falcon and all the ships in space look incredible. They really do. And I remember watching a making of a very long time ago. I think it's on YouTube somewhere. I can try to find it. And they were a lot of models and they were on the fishing line and, you know, they would, I think, blow them up like in practically. Right. Um, So now you got one One take, George. Yeah. Or Um, you got to ask your buddies to build a whole nother. But speaking of an entire industry traces their lineage, local shop Leica that has stop motion where they have computer controlled cameras. I think ILM originated some of that technology in order to do those miniatures, right? And the lightsabers were, at the time, groundbreaking, mm-hmm. right? It was mm-hmm. a big deal. How did they even do that? Oh, my mm-hmm. gosh, I can't believe it. All that stuff was cool. But then also when we talk about from a story perspective, y- you have to directly draw a line between Han Solo and Captain Mal from Firefly, mm-hmm. right? I mean, they almost dress the same mm-hmm. with the vest and, and the pistol and everything. And... You know, handsome, great smile, kind mm-hmm. of snarky. So you see all of these things that really tree out from it. And I'm not one of these people who thinks that George Lucas can do no wrong, but this film is such a, an incredible part of film history. Mm-hmm. It kind of made an entire genre. Absolutely. And well, and didn't it make ILM? Like they were oh, just. Oh, yeah. They, were, they weren't a thing before. Right? Right? I didn't think so. Yeah. But for that, it was too dang long. <laughs> right. I mean, you know, uh, credit to, to Dustin Morrow for sensitizing this, but like I watched this film and I was talking to someone recently saying I, I rewatched this film and not nearly as much Princess Leia as I remember. <laughs> I think I remembered in my mind scenes from Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi that I thought were in the first film. Mm-hmm. And she's not in there as much as I thought she Mm-mm. would be. And it, it was very, it was long. It was like, two hours and five minutes long. Yeah, it was probably 25 minutes too <laughs> long, right? So that was, I found that fascinating for a thing that's trying to mimic the serials, which were themselves very short. Mm-hmm. And it's an action film, in mm-hmm. theory. You would think, yeah, move it along, pop, 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 pop. But you, you mentioned earlier, George had trouble editing himself. Right. And And we now know that he had many, many, many more films in him. Right. And so this was, I think, his second film after American Graffiti, Mm -hmm. which is obviously a totally different genre. Totally. And, but he maybe didn't know he was going to ever make another film. Right. So maybe he's pushing, uh, cramming as much as possible in there. Is the Lord, because we now know, like, we joke with our children that, they will always call this one the fourth one. And we uh, always say, no, this is the first this is one. <laughs> the first one. This is Star Wars. So do you think, is is the story that George knew all along that he had nine films? Or is it nine? Isn't it nine, There right? were nine, yeah. So he knew he wanted to make nine films. No, I don't think so. Because wouldn't that, you start with number, like what is now referred to as number one? Yeah, this was that was a retcon after the fact. He he said, "Oh no, I had nine films, and this is the fourth one." Do you think he really had that, or he was like, "Let's no, he wrote, take a look at how did Vader come to be?" He he wrote a two hundred page script, and they had to cut it down to a film. And then when it blew up and made billions of dollars, he said, "How, uh, can, how can we make more?" Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Apparently, he's admitted that when they filmed the first one, and we wrote it and filmed it. Darth Vader was not Luke Skywalker's father. Really? Yeah. That came in later. Oh, wow. So he he didn't have the whole thing planned out. Who would? Yeah. Right. So, and then now it's, of course, the universe, and there's like Dave Filoni, who has the whole Star Wars universe in his head, uh, far beyond, I think, what George Lucas ever could have possibly envisioned. So it's become, yeah, a franchise and all these things, but I think at the time it was, he was making a He was film. making one film. Yeah, yeah. So an, another interesting thing that I thought was, they filmed in the desert, right? And you say, okay, like, what's the big deal? Oh, but remember, they had people in costumes. So I love one of the things about they they had a trained elephant that they hung <laughs> in fur to be one of these animals. And between takes, the elephant would take off his, his costume because <laughs> yeah, he, he was hot. Yeah, he was like, hot. He didn't like it. Yes, I don't want this. 
But the guy who was in the C-3PO suit, the poor little guy who was jammed into the R2-D2 suit, those guys were dying. And apparently the Chewbacca suit retained quite a foul odor for the duration of the filming, especially after the trash compactor scene. I have heard from Disney cast members that those costumes, they can't ever get the smell out. Right. <laughs> but the other thing about filming in a desert that I don't think of naturally, but I did while watching it this time, is the footprints. So how did they, did they have an <laughs> army of PAs with brooms? And after each take, they would rush out and sweep all of the, the sand smooth so they could do it again. Because if you look at those scenes, there's nary a footprint. So I know that there is a department in a lot of filmmaking called greenery. Right. And their job is of the production design. They're in charge of the flowers and trees and so bushes you think there's and a shrubbery. A yellowery? Well, no, I think it's, oh. no, I think part of the greenery's job was to, yeah. um, Okay. Uh, rake down the sand. Th this seems like maybe that's like a Saturday Night Live skit is the guy who's greensman on, on, on this film. On Tatooine. Yeah. So I just, I thought that was kind of interesting. How, how would you do that? I'd read that Lucas originally thought to put it in a jungle setting. And that's where we get to an Empire Strikes Back with Yoda. I personally would never shoot a movie in a desert because it's extremely hot and sunny. That doesn't make any sense to me. And I, of course, call back to, I read somewhere once that Michael Caine chose the script to do based on where it was filming. Did he want to go there? And that is a savvy actor. Savvy actor. Right. Although, how do you find, especially because remember there was no CG back then. So how do you find places on this planet that could look otherworldly and not have some commercialization Seen in the background, a la, uh, what was it? Was it Young Guns? Yeah, what Young Guns it? with the satellite dish in the background. <laughs> right. And so you would almost have to go to these, like, you know, Monument Valley. But, you know, that's recognizable now. So you can't go there. So you would have to go in the middle of a desert or some other place that looks like a planet we've never discovered yet. Yeah. This is why I'm not an epic action film director. <laughs> Right. <laughs> because I think in terms of, oh, that's a clever looking brick wall. Let's have a medium two shot of a guy with his hat on backwards and his stoner friend talking. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So your your point is quite valid. You have to go pretty far out to find these, you know, strange looking alien landscapes. And that's a lot of effort. I mean, every time we watch any sort of film that has taken place before probably 1990, we both just kind of groan for the set designer and the, you know, the uh, car yeah. person that had to find and the costume or <laughs> right. costumes are probably the easiest part of doing a period piece kind of, right. because that can even be fabricated. And right. But th just whenever we shudder, like we were watching something the other day and it was set in like the fifties or sixties. Yeah. And we were just like, you paused and you were, and it was a main street and you were like, they had to reset dress like every storefront, every storefront. And they every, had to find 28 pristine cars from 1952. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Unless it's a studio lot, that might be a tiny bit easier, but I think what, whatever we were watching, we were, we knew it was, yeah, they went to that. that I, place. I think it might've been walk the line. Yeah. Um, I think you're right. So, but this film actually, you know, it's known for, like I said, the lightsabers and the, the, the graphics of the ships in space. But I wonder if they also had some other technological advances because things that we take for granted now, there's a lot of shots of Han Solo and Chewie running and being chased by the stormtroopers, but there's footage of it. So this was a pre GoPro, right? Like, d did the camera crew run? This is pre steady cam too. So it was on Dolly. So did they have a couple of grips with like Nike sneakers on that were pushing that Dolly that fast when they're running? I mean, that's amazing. These shots were smooth and there was a ton of motion. So uh, those are things like that where I'm like, wow. And then they have, you know, some scenes where they run in, you know, that they matted it later to add like, oh, the big, you know, door to the space or this or that. 
And then the other thing, I, I, I use this film as an example when people ask about storyboards, because I saw one time a storyboard from Star Wars. It's the, the scene at the end where they're getting their medals, and it's a wide showing the whole audience. And the person showed that the storyboard, if you overlay it on top of the actual filmed image, they're identical. And I don't know how many films match that closely to the storyboards. So, I mean, all kinds of crazy stuff went on in this film, and we take it for granted, but at the time, this wasn't groundbreaking. George Lucas was not a big name, right? This was just kind of a mid-budget little science fiction piece. Mm -hmm. Nobody knew it was going to be Star Wars. Well, I did find in a little bit of research, it said a great deal of the movie's visual effects were shot by vintage 1950s VistaVision cameras because of their higher quality than any others available. After this movie was released, the prices of these cameras skyrocketed. And I think the original lightsabers were built from these flash tubes that they said were were basically scrap. They they were just laying around. But as soon as people saw the film, their their price went up because everybody wanted to make their own. And I'm sure Adam Savage could tell you a whole lot more about making that. And one of the things that I read was they said they, in the first film, they were made to look cool, but... They were not ergonomic. They were difficult. And throughout, as the films went on, they had to make them more comfortable to hold and wield. And, and so this film, like all films, has some suspension of disbelief. And the lightsabers are one of them, right? Realistically speaking, if you had a five-foot-long blade of energy that cannot be stopped by anything, you would poke people. You wouldn't try to slash them. It would just be poking. It'd be like a cattle prod more. Yeah, because you want the distance from the other guy. But it doesn't look as cool as samurai katana fighting, right? And that's what this film is about, is it's kind of the rule of cool. Like if you stop and think about some of the stuff, it doesn't make a lick of sense, but it doesn't matter because it's so stinking cool. And how do you codify that? How do you find that magic in a bottle? And one of our favorite, we talk about this a lot, stories Carrie Fisher tells is... George Lucas said she couldn't wear underwear because in space you would expand and your underwear would would cut off the circulation. Having seen Carrie Fisher in this film, I think George just wanted to see her without underwear on. So maybe that's part of the, the magic of Star Wars? I don't know. But Carrie Fisher is part of that magic. We can't think of Carrie Fisher without Princess Leia or vice versa, right? Mark Hamill, amazingly talented guy, apparently an incredible impressionist. And that's probably why he's done a lot of voice acting since. Again, where would he have been? Harrison Ford was a carpenter until he got this role, right? These people, it was just that magic. They found exactly the right people and the right story. And all of the creative folks, I think, reacted to this. Like this was one of those cases where limitations caused them to to make greater art. It was just magic. Well, and to the best of my knowledge... This film was not geared towards children, even though there were quite a few toys that came out of it, but it captivated the imagination of kids. But it also, I mean, we'll talk later when we talk about the numbers, but I remember seeing, you know, images of people lined up, adults lined up to watch this. And so, you know, this was kind of, you had your Disney film, you had your Cinderella's and Snow White's yeah. that parents took their kids to, but primarily it's for the children to enjoy. Right. And this film was one where parents took their kids and I would think everybody enjoyed it. Yeah, I remember vividly when my cousins came down and they were talking about this film and they're like, you have to go see this. They had already seen it. I'll get teary. I went to see that film and I raced home and built an X-Wing with my Legos. Wow. This film is cultural. It so is. Not to like, people use that term maybe too often. No, it absolutely changed. Yes. Everyone Mm -hmm. talked about it. Yeah. And even so much as at the crackpot religious school that I went to, they were upset with it because they felt like the force was some sort of like demon thing. And I found a book in the Scholastic, uh, I think, book, which was comparing it to the biblical story, like Luke Skywalker, how is he like Jesus or what have you. Mm -hmm. So it was like, see, like this isn't Satan. This is actually, 
just think about that. That George Lucas, you made a movie and the church has an opinion on it. Wow. Right? Yeah. I mean, that is literally so much part of culture. It was. It so was. And so there's so many cool things I think that probably they did in the filmmaking, but then that other bit, that, that just magic that makes it something that everyone talks about. It's a whole industry, billion dollar industry. And still, it's still going. I mean. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, because when was the, what we would call the third one? (laughs) And then our kids got wrapped up into it when they, you know, when I guess what they're calling the first one. Well, they had the little, I think they're called galactic heroes. There are a couple inches tall plastic, non-movable little toys. That was, there was like a cartoon that those, those were inspired by, I think. Yeah. So Return of the Jedi was what we would call number three, but they call number six, it right? 83. 83. And so then when did, what was the first one? Attack of the Clones, I think, was supposedly episode one. Did I get that one right? The Star Wars nerds are going to hate me if I get I know. it wrong. Episode uh, two, they're saying, is Attack of the Clones. Oh, so that was yeah. 2002. So I wonder if I said, if I said Star Wars episode one. Yeah. Phantom Menace was 99. Right. So so 16 years, there was a 16-year gap right. where nothing Star Wars happened. No movies came out. There may have been right. there was some pro- animated stuff or something. Right. And, and I want to say we don't, we don't hate watch stuff, but I didn't care for the first three episodes, movies that came out, 99, no. 2002, et cetera. I just didn't care for them. The stuff that came out recently... Uh, seven, eight, nine. I like better. Um, yes. A lot of people have strong opinions, but I thought they were more in keeping with the original. That's what's fascinating is whatever it was the most recent one, Revenge of the Sith. No, that's three. Yeah. The last Jedi. Was that the last one? 2017. Sounds right. Yeah. Whatever one had Adam Driver lightsaber fighting on in the middle, kind of like the ocean. Of with the, the tidal wave. Yes. yes. I loved that one. And that one to me had the spirit yeah. of the first, well, our first one, yeah. the fourth one. And our kids hate that movie. Right. And I'm Is just like, amazing? you are high. Right. And, and I really liked um, <laughs> Rogue One. So anyway, sorry. Uh, my point is that George Lucas, for all of his, whatever feelings he may have as a human being, I don't know the man. Right. He created this whole thing. And how many people can say that that you created a genre, right? Just right, amazing. Right, absolutely. And was Star Trek already a thing? Um, Yes, Star Trek had so been. So like a space drama was already a thing. Right. It had been on television. I think the original, the first Star Trek movie was after Star Wars, if I remember correctly. But I could be wrong on that timing. Do you, do you remember, because since you were... A consumer of this. Yeah. Were there Star Trek toys or was it the yeah. Star Wars toys that maybe inspired, hey, why don't we put a little Captain Kirk? I just had, they were models like model airplanes of the ships in Star Trek. There weren't, oh, well, no, there were, were, there were characters. Yeah, but I did have. As far a, as timing, you don't remember probably. Um, it would have been about that same era. Yeah. So there were G.I. Joe Right, tall figures Barbie size. That, that yeah, that went. Um, I, I think I had a Kirk and a Spock, uh, but I did not do any slash fiction with my Kirk and Spock. They were purely platonic <laughs> coworkers. <laughs> but so I will say, Sorry, and, I digress. And, un, and maybe an in obvious lineage is I believe that the Jawas were the original minions, mm, right? Same you. humor, little guys beating each other up. <laughs> you can't really like, understand yeah, them. Yeah, yeah. A lot of stooge like uh, humor. So it was like, wow, look at that. The minions right. even trace back to Star Wars. So he had some comic relief and he did it too yes. in the dialogue. Like I remember C-3PO right. and would snark basically. Oh, yeah. And as a kid, I didn't really have a model for that, but now... I can't help but hear C-3PO as kind of like the elderly gay man with the extra level of snark. Right. And he maybe even had some some gestures that, that uh, at the time would have, have uh, called that. There's even a bit where a little flying drone gets punched out of the air. And sometimes the drones get like kicked. There's one where like the one that looks like a little toaster 
does a quick U-turn when he sees Chewie and they're like, oh no. And you know, so there yeah. was some humor there in there. There was humor. Yeah. Yeah. I loved it. And there, and like you said, Harrison Ford had some, like, I felt like they were all kind of a little sarcastic towards one another. Yes. Uh, and there is that almost a la moonlighting sparks between Han Solo and Princess Leia. And of course, none of us knew that Leia and Luke were brother and sister at the time. So they had the weird kiss. Ah. I know. And I felt like this time when we watched it, like it was, it felt edited. Yeah. I, well, this version we had was very much edited because they didn't have the budget to put Jabba the Hutt in the originally. So they, George added him in and they layered him on top of an actor who did another role. So I know this was the one that we saw recently was an edited version. Yeah. You mentioned the lightsaber sound. I found this fun in the trivia. Ben Burt mixed the humming of an old 35 millimeter projector at the university where he worked with the sound of interference of a tele coming from a television set. Right. And then the sound of the lightsaber lightsabers clashing was a mix of carbon arc noises. Oh, yeah, from the lights. And the pressing of metal against dry ice. Yeah, if only he'd known that he just had to come talk to me and I could have done those yeah, for him right. for free. <laughs> so you mentioned the Jawas, their language is Zulu, electronically sped up. Greedo's language is Quechua, an indigenous South American language. All right. Maybe that's a little appropriation. Perhaps. But if you speed it up, it's okay. Okay. I don't know if that's the rule. But Is that okay. okay. All right. <laughs> and the music score was done by the infamous John Williams and is ranked as number one on AFI's 100 yeah. Years of Film Scores, which I totally agree. So the thing about that is when I was, uh, again, nine or 10, yeah, I had an LP... For the people who don't know, an LP What's vinyl, that? right? It's this disc of a vinyl that has scratches in it that somehow plays music. But of the music from this, and I loved that so much. And like many of the things in my childhood, that was thrown away with my permission. But anywho, so years later, I bought the the soundtrack to this movie off iTunes, and it's not as good. <gasps> I think the version that I had an LP in order to fit it on the LP, they edited it down. And so it was kind of the 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 highlights. And the mm. one that's available on iTunes is, you know, three hours or four or something is, you know, whatever John Williams wrote, everything he possibly wrote. Right. And they have extra tracks, I'm sure, like demo track and John Williams playing it on his theremin. And it's just like, <laughs> but the music is iconic, right? And I, I remember reading a trivia bit that as they went through this, Mark Hamill went to John Williams and said, oh, Every, there's a Leia's theme and a Darth theme. Why isn't there a Luke's theme? I'll get teary. And he said, the whole movie's theme is your theme. Oh. And so Luke's like, okay. <laughs> I I'm like good. that answer. <laughs> yeah. But I just think as a, as a young actor, I could see him being like, why does everybody why like else? <laughs> and they're like, no, no, the main theme, that's you. Yeah. So, oh. but that music, if I had any musical talent, I would, you know, drawn back and said, oh, yeah, I got into violin because of that, that, that movie. Right. Was there any head trauma in Star Wars? There was a bit. R2-D2 pitches headfirst when the Jawas stun him. Uh, C-3PO and then Luke fall backward when attacked by the Sand People. I previously mentioned the flying drone gets punched out of the air, and then Chewie chops an Imperial officer in the head. Oh! The one time he didn't let the Wookiee win. And we kind of spoiled it. There was a smoochie. Smoochie, smoochie, smoochie. <laughs> there was a smoochie. Yeah. It's more of a peck maybe, but but Leia kisses her brother kind of on the lips. <laughs> and not in a sisterly kind of way. Not in a sisterly kind of way. <laughs> okay. So a different kind of driving, but uh, do you want to do a driving review? Well, we can do a little bit of a A little land speeder? Yeah. I have to say... You know, again, from the category of uh, it's just a movie, Mike, settle down now. But if you have a sand crawler designed to go over rough terrain, uh -huh. you would never make it that tall and top heavy. That makes no sense. I mean, they knew that. Come <laughs> yeah, on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That land speeder, good that you mentioned it, groundbreaking. They apparently did the close up shot toy version with it was basically a boom that was out of shot. But for the ones where it was traveling, they use some sort of mirrors underneath it 
to reflect the ground or something. I don't even know how they did it. It's magic. Mm -hmm. It was the coolest thing ever. I remember as a kid sitting in the theater, like, how did they get a hovercraft? That was the coolest thing ever. And then this is kind of a little bit of a driving review, but I did mention there's a toaster droid. Chewie yells at it, and it does what I would call a Rockford turn. Uh, so technically, I think there is a little bit of driving in here. Somebody with the, the little remote control car did a great job. So good job. <laughs> Shall we go to the numbers? Let's go to the numbers. Okay, before I head there, I'm going to tell you that the second most attended movie of all time in North America, having sold an estimated 178 million tickets over its various theater runs, would which would equate to the gross of approximately 1.48 billion at 2015 ticket prices was Star Wars. What what what's above it? You know, uh, the only movie to have sold more is Gone with the Wind in 1939 with 202 million. Okay, speaking of going past the moral line, Gone with oh, the Wind is way yeah. too long. My mom and I, I don't know how many weekends we would rent. <laughs> This was back when you would go to the video store and rent it. And we were like, okay, we're going to do it. And it was like a two. Oh, di- yeah, you have to get two VHS cassettes. tests. Yeah, because it was so long. And so we would even plan. We were going to get snacks. We were going to maybe watch one one day and one the next. We never did it because neither one. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, 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 so Star Wars is number one for me. <laughs> we rented this from Prime. But if you are a Disney Plus member, you can watch it for free. The budget for this film was $11 million, and like I said, it brought in domestically $461 million, worldwide $775 million. Of the estimated Blu-ray, so since Blu-ray has come out, those have sold, and it's $7.1 million, which you figure that's so much later. Oh, yeah. And it's still that popular. Yeah. And then the domestic take adjusted for today is like $1.7 billion. Yep, yep, yep. It's bananas how much money this movie has made. It gets an 8.6 out of 10 on IMDb and Rotten Tomatoes. Critics give it 93%, while audiences give it a strong A at 96%. Like we mentioned, it's two hours, five minutes. It's rated PG. It is listed as an action-adventure fantasy the studio is Lucasfilms and 20th Century Fox, and it won six Oscars and received 67, well, I should say 61 other wins and 31 nominations. And I said where it was. All right, let's see what we're going to watch next week. Network. Oh, my gosh. All righty. So we're going to watch a network next week and never forget. Dodges never stop and neither do the movies. Thanks for listening to Dodge Movie Podcast with Christy and Mike Dodge of Dodge Media Productions. To find out more about this podcast and what we do, go to dodgemediaproductions.com. Subscribe, share, leave a comment, and tell us what we should watch next. Dodges never stop and neither do the movies. 